This is Real Estate Rookie episode 363. And today we're welcoming back Melanie Wilmisher, who was one of our 90 day mentees from back in early 2023. And today she's here to give us an update on a deal she landed and to really show you what's possible when you have the right plan in place. And we're gonna hear some crazy stories from her Airbnb, so make sure you stick around to the end. As always, I'm Ashley along with my co-host, Tony J. Robinson. And this is the Real Estate Rookie Podcast, where every week, twice a week, we bring you the inspiration, motivation, and stories you need to hear to kickstart your investing journey. And man, I'm super excited to get into today's episode with Melanie. Melanie, as you may have recalled on previous episodes, is a tech professional, and she's an investor out of Colorado. So she was having a hard time getting her third property, and this would be her first time doing an out-of-state investment. Uh, Melanie struggled a little bit to kind of pull the trigger and realized she had to pivot markets mid-search and completely changed where she was looking for a property. Melanie did a really good job demonstrating that setting a clear, actionable goal, also with a little support and guidance in the right areas, can really help you buy your next deal. So if this is something you're struggling with, this is a great episode to listen to. Okay, so let's get into it. Melanie, welcome back. So we've heard it's been a wild last nine months for you. Please catch us up. Uh, what's been going on with your first out-of-state short-term rental and also having to build a team in a, a new market? Thanks so much, Ashley. I am super excited to be back with you and Tony. And yes, it's been a really, really crazy time so many learnings, uh, a lot of good stories to share with you today, and I can't wait to dig in. I'm excited to get into the learnings, right? Because we hear that you've got uh, kind of a nightmare experience uh, from one of your first Airbnb bookings. And unfortunately, this is what a lot of people worry about when they buy that first Airbnb is that something crazy is going to happen. And usually that's not the case. You know, we felt we've seen a lot of people buy their first Airbnbs and usually it's pretty smooth, but you're part of that minority that had a bit of a, a crazy experience. So can you share what happened, Melanie, and, and kind of how you handled it? I suppose there's no better way to learn than to start off with um, a dumpster fire. <laughs> so for my uh, third booking, actually, I had just gotten the property last which, um, as many people know, is a lot of work up front. And I, you know, didn't know my market incredibly well. I was kind of learning about and, and trying to hypothesize what days were going to be, um, you know, the most popular or most desirable. Anyway, we had a booking come through. And um, I got a call one morning from my property manager that uh, the guests, they had just showed up to do uh, the cleaning. And uh, there had been a party. It had gone on for four days. There were probably 50 plus people in the house over the course of the four days. And they had blocked in a number of neighbors and their driveways. Um, and there was significant damage. And my heart immediately dropped. I was just thinking, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? This is brand new. Did I, you know, make a mistake going into this? Um, and essentially my property manager said, I'm going to handle it. He went to the property, started supporting with cleaning, evaluating damages, taking pictures, um, determined there was about $4,000 in damages. Oh my God. I was terrified. I was just, you know, really worried about what was going to happen next. So let me ask in that situation, did you have like the first thing that makes me panic inside is somebody else is coming in and the property is not ready. Did you have another booking that was coming in that day or within the next several days? Yeah, great question. I that was a Tuesday that I got the phone call and I had new tenants coming in on Friday. So we had basically two and a half days to get the property, uh, you know, back in shape, ready to go. Um, and thankfully, you know, I had a fantastic, um, uh, handyman and he came in, um, and they managed to get the property back together before that booking came in at three o'clock on Friday, um, d documenting everything, having to buy a brand new kitchen table and chairs and the work they did was unbelievable. And that total bill, did that end up costing you $4,000 or how did that end up working out with the, the guests that stayed there? Thankfully, no. Uh, the property manager submitted a an intake form to Airbnb's claims, um, the insurance claims, and they were able to recover the entire cost of all the damages. So that included drywall repairs, uh, carpet cleaning, you know, many extra hours of cleaning by the cleaners, and um, some new furniture, uh, among other things. 
Tony, have you had that happen before where you've had to submit a huge claim like that before using the Airbnb air coverage? Yeah, we've never had to go as high as 4,000, which is which is pretty, that was pretty rough, but I'm, I'm glad that it was able to, to kind of work out in your favor. But it, it does go to show that there's layers of protection in place for you as the host when those kind of things happen. And it sounds like your property manager did the right thing of documenting all of the damage, documenting the cost to get everything guest ready, and then let an Airbnb kind of see that uh, evidence as proof that you should be reimbursed for that. I, I think the question that jumps out to me, Melanie, is what, what were some of the lessons you learned? And I, I guess even before the lessons learned, let me ask this. Were you at all discouraged about like, oh man, I'm in over my head. I don't know if I want to do this whole short-term rental thing anymore. What was your thought process kind of going through that? I was immediately discouraged and terrified. I was only thinking about uh, that $4,000 in damage. I had just purchased all of this furniture and it, everything was brand new. And so I was just imagining, you know, the, the bills that were going to come out of this and that, oh my gosh, this was a failed experiment. What did I get myself into? Um, but I have to say the panic only lasted those three days. And then by Friday, 3 PM, I got the text, Hey, the property's ready to go. The guests are on their way all as well. And I kind of reset and was like, okay, let's try this again. Let's see where this goes next. Melanie, what are some of the things that you had on the property or maybe policies, procedures you've put in place that have really helped you through this experience and maybe things that you've even added to the property, such as security cameras or things like that, that you can kind of give guidance as to here's how I'm protecting myself now from preventing this from happening again. I was kind of hoping to start getting bookings and then learn along the way. I didn't expect to learn so quickly, but um, in retrospect, it's it's fine. I did end up getting security cameras within you know a week or so and getting those set up and there were learnings with those too but um that became you know critical for something that happened down the line as well um i will say the one thing i had in place was really strong trust with my property manager uh before before we kicked off bookings um i'd spent a significant time just getting to know him his operating procedures and kind of what he does uh, in an emergency or in a situation like this, he had never experienced anything to this extent with his other properties. So he was learning with me, but just our communication and problem solving together was was kind of the only thing I had in place before the the party. Manly, I, I just want to add some things that we've done in our Airbnb business to kind of mitigate or prevent hopefully things like this from happening. So it sounds like you hit the first one, which was including security cameras in your property. Um, we put security cameras at pretty much every exterior entrance to the property. So front doors, back doors, things of that nature. And it still requires that someone kind of monitors the cameras, at least on somewhat of a regular basis. But say that you, you know, your property is what, like a three bedroom, I think, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Right. So your, your property is a three bed. And, you know, say that you see 20 cars in the driveway on a three bedroom property, that's a red flag there as well. So you can kind of reach out and, and that's your, your first step. The second thing that, that I would recommend for everyone that's listening to kind of prevent the parties from happening is getting uh, some kind of noise detection or noise monitor uh, device inside of your property. There's different brands out there, but we typically put these inside of the property. Um, they don't record, they just monitor sound. And then if sound gets above a certain threshold for say 10 minutes or more, it notifies you to say like, hey, Melanie, there, there's a lot of noise at your property right now. And then you can reach out to the guests and say, hey, just wanna reach out, You know, the neighbors complained, whatever it may be, and would you mind keeping the noise down? And we've had to do that a few times at our properties and it saved us from you know things kind of getting out of control. Um, the third thing you can do is like, say you get those notifications either from the camera or from the noise monitor and the guest continues to, um, let the noise be an issue. All you gotta do at that point is call the cops. And like, if, if you've already asked them to keep it down and they're not, I would say like, Hey, look, sorry, you, you violated my house rules. I'm going to need you to leave. And if they don't call the cops and say, Hey, you know, there's a guest in my property. I've asked them to leave. They're causing a, a noise nuisance for the neighborhood. Please get them out of there. We just had to call the cops and someone two weeks ago, they showed up, knocked on the door and the guests were out like 15 minutes later. Right. So those are the things you can do. If you get to a point where the, the guests aren't respecting the house rules you put in place. Those are awesome recommendations. I, I love the noise monitor. Um, I, you know, another learning related to that was I was kind of 
thinking I had already established a little bit of a relationship with my neighbor. Perhaps he might reach out to me. Um, but he is perhaps the most patient neighbor in the world and just kind of let the party rage. <laughs> Nobody on the whole block called the police. So you got the nicest neighbors. <laughs> I know. Maybe I should be leaning on some some technology instead of nice, proactive neighbors. This is a question for both of you. How are you managing the bad reviews after that? So obviously, if you call the police on someone or even if you send them like a threat with the noise level and they don't think it's warranted at all, how do you prevent them giving you bad reviews because they don't like that confrontation? Yeah. So for for me, what we've seen typically is that um, those guests don't end up leaving reviews a lot of times. Um, but if they do, you can just reach out to Airbnb and say, like, this is a retaliatory review. You know, we we charged this guest because of the noise issue or, hey, we had to forcibly remove them from the property. So they shouldn't even be able to leave a review because we know that it was based on this negative interaction. And usually the folks at Airbnb are pretty understanding and they can say, OK, cool, we, we understand that this is probably not a true reflection of their experience. And maybe they're just mad because they got charged an extra fee or something to that extent. And I guess for you, Melanie, yeah, what was the situation for you? Did they leave a review? What did they say? What, how did that shake out for you? Yeah, in that situation, they did not leave a review. And I was kind of under the impression that once we submitted uh, the insurance claim, they wouldn't be able to. But maybe that's not the case. Perhaps, you know, um, I did have another situation later on where a car was stolen out front of my property. The doors were left unlocked, um, which was Another challenge, but they did leave a three-star review because of that, which is understandable. Um, we did reach out to Airbnb to see if that was something that we might be able to have removed because that can be a pretty damaging review. Um, and unfortunately, they, they didn't want to remove it, but I have tried that technique. Just one pro tip, and I'll, you know, this is for everyone that's listening. Um, call multiple times to challenge a review because a lot of times it depends on which rep you're talking to and you'll get some reps that are, you know, a little harder to get reviews removed with and you'll get other reps that are like, Oh yeah, cool. That makes total sense. Let's get rid of it. Um, so it, it might be worthwhile Melody, to, to give another call in and see if you can get that one removed. Good to know. I definitely did not know that. So one thing this makes me think of, uh, for us, we typically have an age limit to book of, of 25 or older for our short-term rentals. Uh, I guess to clarify, this obviously wasn't your ideal guess The people that stayed at your property and trashed it. Like, who were you trying to kind of target with this property specifically? I was really going for uh, smaller families with kids. Uh, in one of the bedrooms, I specifically put in a bunk bed with a twin bed on the top and a, a queen bed on the bottom, hoping to get families with two or three kids. Um, and, and for the most part, that has been the audience I've attracted. I think the real, uh, the, the real challenge I ran into at that time was because it was one of my first few bookings, um, the stays are discounted to to attract bookings to your property in the beginning. And so um, I don't think we had an age limit. And I also think that the property was perhaps the most affordable in the entire area because there was this broader party, broader college party going on um, on a nearby island. So what are some of the things you're doing now that is it just increasing the price that so that you are getting the target audience that you or not target audience, I guess, a target guests that you want to stay into your property? So we are using dynamic pricing now, which has helped us just be aware of how busy other properties are and get a higher rate on bookings um, instead of you know being the cheapest one available. Uh, we also, and we did have a process in place where we were looking at the reviews and doing um, kind of monitoring profiles, seeing other reviews that had been left. I haven't done anything differently. Honestly, this is a good learning around optimization for me just to prevent this in the future. But um, I, I guess really the short answer is that's a growth opportunity because we're kind of continuing as we were. So Melanie, you mentioned a little bit about your market and the, it sounds like if there's a, a co college area in that thing that you had a, there was a party going on and a, an island, things like that. So I want to know a little bit more about this market and how did you find this market and why do you think it's a great short-term rental market? The market I picked is Savannah, Georgia, and I picked it 
largely because of the price point. I had previously been looking in Florida and um, I was really just not getting any traction there. I wasn't having great luck. And so I continued to find areas that would be a little more affordable. And Georgia was kind of on that list, um, Savannah specifically, because of so many uh, tourist destinations and so many attractions like the historic landmarks and SCAD, which is the College of Art and Design. Um, I wanted to be kind of close to that and, and more centrally, centrally located towards um, tourist attractions. Yeah, you were looking at another market prior to that and you kind of switched gears. Uh, what are some of the things that you do during your market analysis? So what was the reason you decided to leave your other market and what did you find in that initial analysis? And then this new market, what are some things if a rookie investor is looking to do their research, invest out of state? Can you name a couple things that they should be looking at when deciding on which market they should pursue? Definitely. I am a big proponent of tools uh, just to kind of take the analytical uh, analytical perspective using numbers. Um, I spent a lot of time on Airbnb just clicking into bookings and specifically looking at uh, how many nights were booked in a property, kind of how prices varied. And that was actually one thing that steered me away from Florida. As I was looking at some of the local Airbnbs in, in Tampa specifically, I was finding that there was just so much availability and there were so few nights booked at so many properties. I was nervous about the competition. Um, I also looked into a couple of other cities like Kansas City and St. Louis, and I kind of found similar things there. Um, and I didn't only use Airbnb. I used um, oh, AirDNA and um, Price Labs. And I think, Tony, you recommended Price Labs and um, Rabu as well to kind of uh, look at some reports, especially because you can do a lot of filtering around bedrooms and bathrooms and all of the features you have. So I used a lot of that information and, and that kind of helped me determine that there was a little bit less competition in Savannah, a few properties available. The nightly rates were a little bit more desirable compared to what I was going to spend on the property. Um, and that kind of all contributed to landing on that market. So Melanie, if you kind of reflect on that, that thought process of trying to choose the right city, like, what did that look like? Like, what was kind of going through your mind at that time? Yeah, uh, good good timing, Tony, because I was actually looking back through my intentional at intention journal this morning, and I found this entry that I wrote in December of last year. And I won't read the whole thing, but uh, briefly, it says, In review of the last week, I looked at St. Louis, Kansas City, Savannah, and Denver for different opportunities. Savannah seems to show promise with some of the calculations I've been running. I read Avery's short-term rental book and started David Green's long-distance real estate investing. I've got a lender arranged in Savannah and an agent working with a larger, more well-known firm, but I'm not exactly uh, 100% confident that I have my ideal team yet. I also have my search in Florida still active, and I'm just matching, excuse me, just watching what properties pop up, plus trying to keep learning. Maybe I need to look for some references. I want to keep growing. I love that you're using the intention journal, and I, I love that it actually played a role in you making this decision. And for all of our rookies that are listening, if you want to pick up a copy of the intention journal, just head over to uh, biggerpockets.com slash bookstore, search for intention journal, and it's on there. Um, you, you talked a little bit about building your team out, Melanie, and I want to get into that in a second here. But before we do, when you when you think about Savannah, what were some of those like economic drivers that you saw in that market that kind of drew you to that city? Definitely the colleges. There's a number of uh, locations for University of Georgia. And I just assumed, you know, May is a great time. Graduations, um, you know, students coming in and out and parents visiting is always going to bring people to the city. And then secondarily to that, I had learned that they were building a Hyundai factory in the area and they were expecting a lot of population growth. Um, and at this point, I don't think they've broken ground on that. <laughs> I need to check. I haven't heard anything, but, uh, I do know that the city has been growing and, um, there has been, I even have seen just a slight increase in property value, just, you know, using Google search and such. On that note, Melanie, you, you talked about increase in property value. So, you know, you're, you're in Colorado, slightly more expensive market. What was the price point in Savannah? The average price was anywhere between, I would say, 
230, 270, upwards of 300. Uh, but at this same time, interest rates were just slowly climbing. And so as they were climbing, my price point was shrinking, uh, partially pushing me out of the, the market in Florida where the average price point was 400. Um, and so I ended up finding this property under 250, which was a huge win. Uh, Melanie, I just looked it up for you and the Hyundai factory is billi- being built right now and it should be having a uh, production go through it. So employees start working there by 2025. So awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Ashley. <laughs> okay. So with this property, you you're having it as a short-term rental, but did you actually explore having it as a long-term rental or maybe even flipping it? Did you have to do a lot of work to the property bef- besides just furnishing it? I did consider if it would be a good long-term rental or a good mid-term rental as backup strategies or exit strategies. And it was possible, but if I did have to go long-term, chances were that I weren't. I wasn't going to cover my expenses fully. Um, I probably would cover my mortgage, but I was unlikely, it would be unlikely to also cover the property management expenses. Um, With a midterm rental, I could also do that, but the cost that my property manager was going to charge was the same for midterm and short term. And so I kind of thought, what do I have to lose just going a little bit bigger? And if if he's going to manage it the same way, let's just try to increase the the revenue potential. Did you do a lot of rehab to it where you could have, I, I, cause in my mind I was thinking, could you, you know, end up flipping the property and selling it if it didn't end up working out as a rental? Actually, I did not consider flipping it because when I bought it, it was recently flipped and I never actually saw the property in person before I purchased it. And they took great photos. Uh, and that's one thing you don't know unless you go see a, a property in person. So here I am showing up at my property a few days after close thinking it's been flipped. It's in great condition. And there were a number of things that just weren't in the photos. Uh, the dishwasher had some issues. The garage door didn't open. There were some electric issues. Um, there was some broken siding. Um, there were uh, some electrical outlets that needed some help. And it wasn't anything major, you know. Uh, I think I spent maybe $3,000 on, on unexpected repairs, but it was something, you know, that's, that's an additional $3,000 that you don't want to spend. Melanie, you said that you bought the property sight unseen, which uh, obviously you already had some investing experience going into this, but a lot of rookies, I think, have fear around buying that out-of-state property without getting their own eyes on it first. What did you do? Like, What steps did you take to make yourself feel comfortable to buy this first Airbnb sight unseen? I really built a lot of trust with my team. Um, that started with working with the property manager and actually sending him addresses long before I started, you know, working with some of the other team members to just ask him what he thought about the areas, ask about the potentials and kind of how, how nice the neighborhood looked. And he was willing to drive over to some of the locations and say, Hey, you might want to reconsider because of this, or Hey, this is a great opportunity because of this. And that was huge because he kind of helped pick what I think is an up and coming neighborhood with, with a new shopping center nearby it. And, um, that was huge. On top of that, I also had a realtor who I really trusted. He did video walkthroughs with me. Um, and, you know, would answer all of my questions was really patient because I was just trying to be cautious. Uh, but I have to say, ultimately, you know, there are consequences of not seeing the property and there are things that you can't prepare for. And, and that's just kind of a cost of doing business. But, um, that doesn't mean it's, it's not worth it. It's definitely worth it. And there is some element of thrill to that too. So having your, you know, your team drive around, look at the properties, things like that. Uh, what were some of the things specifically that you were, or maybe they were telling you, this is what makes a good neighborhood and this was what makes a bad neighborhood? Like you said, they said, you might want to reconsider this. What would be an example of some of those things that would make you change your mind as to maybe I don't want to have a house on the street? Homes on the block that are in disrepair or are, um, you know, have a ton of cars outside or, you know, it's backs up to a building or something that's undesirable. 
Um, it's a little bit too far out of town, not something that you would notice from only looking at Google Maps, but something you would know from actually making the drive. Those are some of the things that they help to point out. Um, on the flip side, some of the positive things were um, there are some other homes that are popping up for sale and they are, they've are they been recently updated. Their values are a little bit higher than the house that you're looking at. Um, there seems to be growth and development happening, which will eventually impact your property value and, and bring some new owners into the neighborhood. Melanie, tell us how you found this great team and what can other rookie investors do or even Tony and I do to find great people to work with in different markets, especially when you don't have that opportunity to meet them face to face and you have to hire them virtual pretty much. <laughs> I started on bigger pockets. I started in the, the forums reading through um, mostly people who had invested in Florida and asking them for agents. And that's actually how I found an agent in Florida. But then I went back to the drawing board and that was how I also found my first agent in Savannah. Um, Unfortunately, that agent didn't work out and I ended up stepping away from that partnership and came back to Bigger Pockets. Uh, another person who had been on um, the podcast recommended a different agent. So through a trusted referral, essentially, and that agent ended up being phenomenal. Um, I found my property manager through the first agent. So even though we parted ways from you know a transaction perspective, he introduced me to uh, the local property manager. And there weren't a lot of options for property management just because most property managers operate in Savannah proper. Um, so I really was hopeful that that the property manager I started talking to would be fantastic. And he ended up being so. Um, I found my insurance agent by calling a ton of companies locally. And I also found my lender um, through the second agent I started talking to. Sorry, and to add to that, one of the best uh, people in my team is my handyman who came through the second agent I worked with, and he has been a godsend. So um, a lot of asking around, a lot of bigger pockets resources, and then I would say just spending a lot of time talking to those people and building a lot of trust in those relationships um, has been really positive. Melanie, did your property manager have a handyman that you could use um, or did they have contractors and what made you decide to go and find somebody else on your own to, to have available? Uh, it's funny. My property manager did not have a handyman. In fact, I introduced him to my handyman and I feel as though that only strengthened my relationship with him. Um, now they partner together on a lot more properties. And so using kind of that network, I think, really helped our relationship. But um, I guess in retrospect, it's interesting that he didn't already have one on his staff. Melanie, one thing I, I want to know, uh, obviously, you've got a full time job, you have other real estate investments outside of this one that we're speaking on right now as well. But what was your motivation for hiring a property manager versus self managing this property? Oh, I genuinely have no idea if I could have done it without a property manager. Um, my job is really stressful. It takes almost all of my time. Um, sometimes I also am, you know, selling properties as a realtor if there is free time, which isn't often. So, you know, I really didn't even consider self managing. I wanted someone boots on the ground who could go to the house, who knew the cleaners. And I just didn't even entertain trying to do it alone. So Melanie, what was your initial goal with this property in Savannah? Part of it was to have a property in a warmer part of the country so <laughs> I could leave Colorado in the winter. And so that was a huge value add for just buying in, um, you know, in, in a warmer area. Beyond that, I was hopeful to make a thousand dollars a month in profit, largely because my long-term rental was generating just a little under a thousand dollars. And my, my thought was if I can stand up a short-term rental, ideally it's more profitable for than a, a long-term rental. And if that's the case, like I'd like to continue using that strategy moving forward. So let's get into some of the numbers on this deal. Um, so what was the debt structure that you used to buy this? What kind of loan product was it? I used a second home loan, putting 10% down. 
Interestingly, your second home only has to be, I think, 60 miles from your primary residence. Uh, so I was surprised to be able to use that. There's even some caveats to that. You know, it depends on which lender you're working with, but say that it's even under that, and I've heard 50 miles, but somewhere in that 50, 60 mile range, but say that you can prove that it's a, it's a totally different kind of like um, experience you can still qualify for that second home loan. So say that your your primary residence is like in the suburbs and maybe if you drive, you know, 40 miles up a mountain and now you're like in a snow type environment, you can get a second home there. And then say you drive 40 miles in another direction and you're like at the beach, you can get a second home there, which is maybe not common everywhere, but in California, that's like a thing I can drive 40 miles and be at the beach or, or the snow. So there are some, some caveats to that as well. With that 10% down second home loan, Melanie, um, what was your like ballpark? What's your your mortgage on that? My purchase price was two hundred and forty thousand dollars. Putting ten percent down, I put twenty four thousand dollars down. That doesn't include closing costs, and my monthly payments uh, are eighteen hundred dollars a month. Jeez, eighteen hundred bucks a month. Six point six percent interest rate. <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah, but that's still pretty good, right? I mean, you know, say that rates do kind of dip down as we get into the back half of this year, even sometime in the future, you, you've got a, a good opportunity there. And then do you know ballpark what your monthly expenses between utilities and repairs and maintenance, consumables, all those things? Yes. So I was just looking at this today. Average monthly cleaning fees are about $850. Uh, my average monthly repairs are about $125. My average monthly uh, property management costs are about $640 and utilities on average are $430. So the way that I look at that is on average, my total monthly expenses are about $2,860. The monthly gross income has fluctuated significantly. So this was hard to look at for the first few months, but now that I'm Crossing into the ninth month, I'm seeing about uh, just over $4,000 of average income per month. Um, so that is giving me an average uh, profit of about just under $1,200 per month. That is awesome. So let's let's do some quick math here, right? You know, Tony's got to break out the the calculator. Say so you're doing about 1200 bucks per month over 12 months. It's fourteen, just over $14,000. Your down payment was twenty four k. I don't know, maybe closing cost and setup. What would you say your all-in cost when you include closing costs and like design and furnishing? Kind of estimated around fifty-two thousand dollars all in furniture, everything. So you're you're cash flowing about twenty-eight percent on this deal, which is pretty darn good, especially given a you know plus six percent interest rate. So you know you you bought this deal in twenty twenty-three, have still found a way to make it profitable for you. And man, I'm just super excited to to see that this property is done done so well for you, Melanie. Thanks, Tony. I was super nervous to share those with you today. <laughs> no, that's great. And Melanie, your goal was even to break even on this property, and then you want to be able to use it too uh, to stay there in the winter months too. So that's awesome to be able to have some personal use with it. Thanks. I am. I have been reluctant to go stay there because I have been trying to kind of earn back some of what I put into it. But I am really, really hopeful that I'll get to do that this year. What was your favorite part about this property of putting it all together and making this deal happen? And now that it's come alive, actually going out there myself and furnishing it was definitely the best part. I flew out there four days after I bought it. And um, I would kind of evaluated all of the services that will go and furnish your house for you. And I realized the cost would be about the same as what I was estimating the cost to be if I did it myself. And so I just said, I'll go do it myself and learn. Um, and I was going to fly out and, you know, order some Amazon mattresses to the house, sleep on the mattresses, furnish the house, and then fly home in four days and go back to work which definitely did not happen. I ended up being there like a week and a half. Nothing showed up on time. Um, I had to have my mom come and fly out. My property manager had to finish it. But um, one of the, the best wins I had was there was somebody down the street doing a garage sale of everything from Crate and Barrel you could imagine. And I basically cleaned him out and furnished half my house with that for really low cost, which was amazing. That's super cool. And that's one of the benefits of like looking locally. Like, you know, I know some people who furnish their Airbnbs, like yeah, yard sales, maybe Facebook marketplace, things like that. And 
you know, you can really save a ton if you're on a budget trying to set up your Airbnb and it's a really, really smart way to go. Um, I, I guess for you, Melanie, beyond the guests, uh, you know, the, the orange crush party, what are maybe some other key issues that you've seen with your Airbnb in these past nine months? I have gotten some feedback that um, I didn't have enough furniture, which was interesting. I didn't really think uh, that that would be something that would come up. Um, but, you know, I missed the opportunity to furnish it and make it super, super cozy. I was trying to have enough in there and kind of learn from there. So that was a learning. I needed to come back and add more furnishings, which extended the time to actually kick off. Um, and in retrospect, I would probably invest more into just making it really, really cozy and welcoming um, to save that time later on. Um, I also learned that you can't know everything about the neighborhood you're investing in because your property manager and your realtor can only, um, you know, do as much as they can with, with their time. And uh, I have found that there are other like having that car stolen, which I mentioned earlier, is just a complication I could have never expected. And um, even though it was so fun to not go see this property myself, that's something I'd probably do in the future just to, you know, know even more. So Melanie, we've heard all about Savannah, Georgia, the property. Now we want to get into kind of where you're going next with your short-term rental business. Um, So I guess maybe what are some things that you feel that you can improve on going into this next year? I think there's a lot of room to optimize. Uh, One thing that I learned this year was that extended stay bookings are fantastic because the cleaning fee is, you know, there's only one cleaning fee, even if someone stays for 28 days. So I'd love to drive a lot more of those. Um, that has been great at the end of the year. I also just having stayed at a bunch of Airbnbs this year, there were a number of places that had bachelorette party kits or just fun things that, you know, you wouldn't expect to be in a home, but made your stay even better. I want to add some more things like that. Maybe some, um, you know, just other thoughtful touches to Ashley's earlier point, even more pillows because everyone loves pillows. Um, and then I, I would also like to be offering a second booking at like a 10% discount. So I know you can do that with a QR code or, or invite customers to book through your website or reach out to the property manager. Because of the lack of time that I've had, I really haven't spent um, enough. I haven't done enough research there. And my property manager has been a little bit slower to start some of those things up. Um, so I'm hopeful to try a few of those different things next year or this year. One thing that I can get, kind of give you a piece of advice on is like hiring somebody to do that for you, just like in a consultant or, you know, going on Upwork and just like listing what you're looking for and pay somebody who's probably already done that for a bunch of other people to just complete that for you as to like creating the QR code that sets up the discount and things like that, where you don't even have to wait for the property manager. You don't have to do it yourself. Um, I've been doing that more and more frequent of like things I want to implement, but just don't have the time to actually sit down and do it. That having just like hiring somebody per a task um, has been super helpful and like they're able, they know what they're doing. So they're able to get it done a lot more and it, it ends up being very cost effective than me spending time trying to figure it out. So I love that idea. I did not know you could do that. <laughs> I post like all these random things on Upwork. Now. <laughs> like, <laughs> even for our property management company, we have a consultant we've been working with for a month now where um, I just pay her a, a fee based on what we're working on. And she's been implementing all these new SOPs for me and like here's the way that you should do it through your software and things like that and it's been super helpful where I know what I want to do but I don't want to be the one that actually sits down and does it and takes the time to implement it so it's been really great. I love that. That made my mind go to one thing that has that I want to definitely improve in the year ahead and that's tracking expenses. I do everything in Excel spreadsheets, which is great, but so time intensive that I really want to make that a lot more streamlined next year. And that would be such a great thing to post on Upwork and say, I have this spreadsheet with all of my expenses. This is how I'm tracking it. I'd love to, you know, you don't even have to say, you know, I'd love you to put it into QuickBooks for me or, you know, you know, do my bookkeeping in QuickBooks, like you could even make it open. I'm looking for a better way to be more efficient with my process. 
um, for my bookkeeping and tracking my expenses and things like that and see what ideas people bring to you too. Tony, how are you tracking your expenses for your short-term rentals? We used to do everything in Stessa. Um, and that was like free software that worked really well. Now we have our, our bookkeeper who kind of does the bookkeeping for all of our properties. Once we got to like 20, I couldn't do the books myself anymore. I was like spending too much time every week doing that. So now everything's set up in QuickBooks and we just get P and L's at the end of, of every month now. Uh, we want to let you ask any questions you have, but before we get into that, can you just give us an idea of what your overall portfolio looks like right now? So maybe like the overall value of your property, if you have any partners and kind of what percentage you own. And if you know, like across your entire portfolio, which are gross in and kind of net numbers look like, we'd love to hear that as well. I'm going to give you the numbers that I found and maybe you can help me refine them in case I have some, some edits to make. But um, generally today, the value of the two homes that I own by myself are about 716000 and I have uh, around $500,000 in debt there. I also have a little bit of ownership in our primary residence, specifically for the basement unit that we rent out. Um, and so if we're throwing that in there, the total value is around $1.3 million with about 800000 in debt. Now, I don't know if this is the right calculation, but I'm, I looked at that as 62% debt to equity. Sounds about right. Yeah. If you're doing like 800,000 over 1.3 is your portfolio value. That sounds about right. And then in total with all of the income coming in from those properties, the gross income is around 93,000 and um, net income after all expenses is around 37,000. That's crazy. $37,000 a year in cash flow. Like that's, that'd be like if you went out and got like a a part-time job. That was my first job out of college. I'm pretty sure it was like 35,000, maybe not even 37,000. <laughs> some of that income is coming from, you know, a shared property and some of that perhaps that's not the right calculation because we ultimately take that income and put it towards the mortgage payment. So, uh Yeah, the- but even still yeah, just re- regardless of how you put those, you know, that profit to use, it's still profit at the end of the day, right? Which I think is super impressive. And the fact you're doing that with, a, you know, a relatively small portfolio to be kicking off that much profit is is amazing. So kudos to you. That's that's awesome to hear, Melanie. Now, I, I, we want to finish off by giving you a chance to maybe ask any questions you have. Obviously, you, you, you know, you first got introduced to us as one of our mentees and super excited that you've been able to take some action based on what we shared last year. But based on where you're at right now, what do you feel you need help with? How can Ashley and I help? I think my biggest challenge right now is just getting back into the flow of uh, looking at deals and starting to gravitate to a new strategy. I've um, recently met a partner that I know I want to work with and we're kind of starting almost at square one with like, what is the main strategy? we want to go after. We've chosen our market, which is Denver, but we're throwing out subject to and TRs, long-term rentals. And I know you guys can't help me choose that, uh, but just maybe some guidance around how you're you're encouraging others to approach this market with you know changes that might be coming to the real estate market um, in the year ahead. Well, we actually just had a great episode. This is the only thing I could think of right off the bat. The first thing when you start talking about trying to figure out what your strategy is with your new partner. We just had Dave Meyer on, on episode uh, 356. And he has a new book coming out called Start With Strategy. And it is all about determining what your vision is and how to back build it backwards and build what your strategy should be to kind of fit the life and everything that you desire to fit around that instead of just being like, oh, flipping sounds fun. I'm going to do that. And then you end up like, this is way too much time consuming. This doesn't work for me. This isn't what I want. And it's not meeting my financial needs, it's not meeting my personal life desires. So reading that book, I think would be a, a great first resource of start with why. And then also for your new partnership, uh, mine and Tony's book, Real Estate Partnerships. Uh, so anyone else interested in reading those books, you can go to biggerpockets.com slash bookstore to, to find them both those books. But as far as the, the strategy, I think the biggest thing is coming into alignment with your partner as to what you want out of this. 
Is this, you know, a long-term relationship, a short-term relationship where you just want it to be one deal and kind of done, Um, which I recommend at least starting with one deal instead of saying, oh, we're going to buy 10 deals together. But is this something you could see where you're building like a portfolio together or you just want to flip a property to get some capital? So what are your guys' goals right now and also kind of in the future too? And what strategy do you need to do to actually achieve those? And are they the same? So do you have kind of an idea of why you want to buy another investment property right now? Those are really helpful recommendations, Ashley. And and generally to answer your last question, one of the reasons we went into this partnership is because we have alignment as kind of a core value around wanting to add more properties to our portfolio that are increasingly passive. So even less management than just my small amount of involvement on the short-term rental, if possible, um, and an increasing um, profitability as well. We both want to have more travel in the year ahead. And, and those are some of the things that are really important to the lifestyle we want to cultivate. So that's still incredibly open-ended. We definitely have more work to, to refine that, but um, I appreciate some of that direction. Yeah. And I think one kind of question you could add to that too, is to like, what resources do you both have available already? Like, do you both already know like a super property manager that does long-term rentals or do you already know a manager for medium-term rentals that you know will do a great job? So thinking about who your resources and kind of like your boots on the ground are already too, can kind of help you know, like, okay, passive is one of our goals. And I know that if we buy a long-term rental, that it is going to be passive because we already have this great property manager that we can hire instead of, you know, deciding, well, we're going to go short-term rental, having to find that short-term rental manager and kind of testing them out until you actually find the one that you want to. Um, I think having resources and like having a team and kind of building your strategy around what they can also do too can be pretty beneficial also in helping you decide, especially if you don't have a preference as to what it is, as long as you are passive and you're making income off of it. And then I think lastly, that you know, obviously the piece is to tie in where do the numbers work. Uh, Tyler Madden, who's been a guest on the show, he bought a three unit and it's in Denver. And the goal of it was to be um, short-term rentals. Well, as they're rehabbing it, they found out that they actually can't do short-term rentals. And so they had to pivot and turn it into a medium-term rental. And they actually ran their numbers as the long-term rentals to make sure that worst case scenario, they had to do it as long-term rental, they would break even. So doing the medium-term rental, they're still like cash flowing good on this property. Probably not as great as if it was a short-term rental, but they actually had bought that property with having the option of doing all three of those strategies. Yeah, those are all really solid points, Ashley. And I think the only thing that I'd add to that, Melanie, is that as you and this new partner think about strategy and and kind of what makes the most sense for you is just also think about like, what are the superpowers that come out of your relationship, your partnership together? Like if you look at the strengths of, of both of you as individuals, which strategy is is best supported by those strengths? You know, and if you found that you really do have a love for design and and kind of picking out the finishings and stuff, then maybe it's flipping in Denver. And if your partner is really good at finding off market deals, whatever it may be. So I think look at the skill sets that each of you have, where you can really um, shine as individuals. And then that'll give your your partnership a really well-rounded approach because both of you are operating in your areas of strength, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I love those recommendations. Would either of you be willing to share how you've created contracts with a partner and how you've approached um, outlining roles or responsibilities or how you split profits or who does the investing or if it's equal, et cetera? Yeah, we can uh, send those to you. Tony and I actually included this in our book too, is the an operating agreement if you're doing an LLC with a partner and also a joint venture agreement too. So I think those are all, if you buy the ultimate real estate partnership book package or whatever on biggerpockets.com, you can get that, but we'll, we'll send it to you, Melanie, and you can kind of see the contract as to like how you can break the different stuff out. And then obviously, you know, it'll be state dependent, like the operating agreement I put in is New York state and Tony's 
joint venture agreement is specific to, you know, him using it in California, but um, you can kind of go through that and see how we do our different partnerships. Well, I uh, would love to just take a second to thank you both so much for all of the support. I I know that things would not have unraveled the way they did without so much of your influence along the way and recommendations to get this property. And so I look forward to taking this information into the to the next property ahead and, and being able to share with you in the future that hopefully it is similarly successful. Yeah. And we can't wait to hear about it. And this has been so amazing. Thank you for including us in your journey of getting this next property. And we're excited to see where you're going to go on your journey. Melanie, it was great to have you back. And I I really loved how we learned your process of setting your team up out of state, buying property sight unseen, learning to manage and make improvements at your own pace as you go on this journey and and really just the importance of knowing your numbers so you can weather those storms when they hit. So I appreciate you sharing all that guidance with the rookie audience today. And if you want to reach out to Melanie, learn more about her, uh, share some inspiration or motivation with her, you can check out the show notes in the description below and to find out where to reach her at. You can also find uh, Tony and I on social media. We'll link our information in the show notes also. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Melanie, thank you for taking the time to come back onto the Real Estate Rookie podcast. We really appreciate it. We'll see you guys next time. Still-